everybody, and welcome. Thank you all so much for coming to tonight's How To Academy event. Shortly joining us on stage is Mervyn King and Martin Wolf. Martin is the Chief Economics Commentator at the FT, and Mervyn is a professor at LSE, and also was the former governor of the Bank of England. They'll be talking on the topic of the crisis of democratic capitalism. <laughs> and frankly, I can't think of two better people to be talking about this. They'll be in conversation for about 50 minutes, and then it'll be over to you for audience questions. So please don't be shy. But for now, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mervyn King and Martin Wolf. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mervyn King, and we're here tonight. It's a privilege to be here to listen to Martin Wolf, the chief economics commentator of the FT, about his new book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. It's hard to think of three more important words to describe today's challenges than crisis, democratic, and capitalism. When the Berlin Wall fell in uh, 1989, people assumed then that this was the triumph, the ultimate triumph of democratic capitalism. At that point, the idea that the word crisis would enter the same, be on the same page as democratic or capitalism was unthinkable, let alone in the same sentence as it is now. And things today are really very different. Now, I'm going to interview Martin for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we'll open the discussion for you to ask your questions. And I can't think of anyone better qualified in the world to guide us through the complex and disturbing currents of what is happening in economics and politics together today than, than Martin Wolf. His previous books were definitive works on the financial crisis and globalization. And Martin always takes a global view something we don't always get in domestic coverage of economics and politics. So, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Wolf. <laughs> now, what I propose to do in discussing with Martin his book is to start off with the symptoms, and then the diagnosis, and then finally the cure. Now, before Martin, I ask you why you wrote this terrific book, can you give us the one paragraph summary of the book? Well, I was asked this by Times Radio this morning. Since I had only five minutes for the interview, it really was just about a paragraph. So the one paragraph summary of the book is, we are in a mess. And we are in a mess because our very complex and very original political and economic relations, something I hadn't fully realized before I started this work, is fracturing. And that is essentially because the uh, economic system as it is now run is not delivering to the peoples of our countries, including all the high-income democracies, and notably including the US, what they want to feel satisfied with the way their lives are going and with the way their societies have been governed and led. And this has led them to profound disillusionment and skepticism, and that in turn leads them to entrust their future to scoundrels and worst, who then, in a vicious circle, make the problem worse and them angrier. And the relationship that has broken down is a reciprocal relationship between a democratic political system and a market economy, and which can be mutually supportive, and in some important ways is, but can also be mutually destructive. And that is, I think, now where we are. Excellent. Well, we're going to discuss aspects of this as we go on. But before we do that, let me ask you, why you decided to write this book? Well, 
all the main books I've written have been in response to something that is going on. Uh, because I am, in the end, a journalist, and therefore I react to events. But I try to set them in a broader context. So the globalization book you mentioned, which focuses on globalization and development, very important, was in reaction to many critics, critics in the late 90s who argued that globalization was utterly destructive of developing countries and blighted and ruined their hopes. And that seemed to me quite a serious mistake. And I think what's happened since then in China and India, many other countries suggested that was wrong. The shifts and the shocks came out of the biggest financial crisis of my lifetime. And my reaction was, how did this happen? It was so far worse, much worse than I'd expected. I knew there were problems, big runs, and I wrote about them. So why did that happen? I, uh, so I had to sort out why it happened. And I spent a couple of years on this. And then, uh, well, it was really 2016. Um, Donald Trump, it was already obvious when I started thinking about this, was likely to be the presidential candidate for uh, uh, the Republican Party and might become president, quite unthinkable, three years before, two or three years before. Uh, in Britain, we were engulfed in the Brexit campaign, which was essentially assault on the elites, the establishment. Uh, which went through and head, and we were seeing similar things like go through in many other countries. And so I then said, well, it's pretty clear that our po politics are turning against our existing establishment and elites very profoundly, one. Two, the characteristic this is taking is right-wing populism, which is itself rather surprising to me. Um, rather than left-wing populism, though we had the Corbyn interlude in, in here. And some of it began to look to me <coughs> frighteningly similar to what had gone on, though there were many differences, which I discuss, in the 1920s and 30s, in a similar, not as bad, but a, a not, ours is nothing like as bad, but a similar period of economic and political disarray. So I wanted to sort out what was going on, why was this happening, what did it mean, and that's why I decided I had to write this book. Now, in the early chapters, you, you, there's a phrase that you use. You say that we're in a democratic recession. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's not my phrase. Um, so when I started working on this, <coughs> sorry, I better take some more. I've been doing a lot of talking about the book today. So when I started thinking about this, obviously, I know quite a bit of the economics. I knew about the financial crisis. I understood that that was devastating, and we'll come to that, I'm sure. But I decided I had to start reading books by serious analysts of politics, democratic politics, populism, and all the rest of it, so I did. And one of the leading scholars in the world on democracy uh, um, is a man called Larry Diamond, who's a professor at Stanford. Uh, and he uh, wrote a very seminal piece already, I think about 2008 or so, I can't remember the exact date, called The Democratic Recession. And his argument basically was that in the period between roughly 1980, slightly before that, and uh, the early 2000s, there was an enormous wave of democratization across the world. Obviously, in the, in the former Soviet Union and its empire, in, but also in many developing countries, notably in Africa, uh, um, um, dictatorships were replaced by democracies. And it was becoming al obvious already in that early period that this was beginning to reverse. You could see important figures like Erdogan in Turkey, Orban in, uh, beginning to emerge in Hungary, but there were many others. And so he, he invented this phrase, the democratic recession. And uh, since then, there has been a great deal of research in the world's value surveys, which I cite, which are very interesting, other opinion polls, the, the documentation by Freedom House, which is an American think tank, which is probably the most authoritative, independent think tank looking at 
uh, the state of democracy in terms of basic legal principles, civil rights, freedom of association, integrity of electoral processes, all these obvious things. And Freedom House has documented uh, basically over the last 16 years, it's very consecutive and I've got some quotations, that essentially it's got worse all the time. Uh, and strikingly, given where they are, the country where they think it's got in the developed world, where they think it's got worse most badly, is the US uh, of the, the big Heineken countries. And obviously that's incredibly important because the US has been, and the bubble was in the middle of the 20th century, the decisive country in preserving uh, liberal democracy, one would have to say. Um, so uh, that's the democratic recession, and it's not just in developing and emerging countries, though there's lots of that but it's also very clearly in developed countries and the US is one of the leaders. We're not as bad as the US, but we're not the, among the best anymore. So one of the interesting phenomena in the US is that, uh, to go back to the opinion polls that you mentioned, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, it, when people interviewed American citizens about the previous presidential election, the question was, did you vote for the successful candidate? And when people said no, the question was, well, what's your reaction to the winning candidate? And back in the 50s and 60s, the reaction was, I wish him well, because he's our president. Well, I don't think you'll get many people who say that today. Almost nobody. Yeah. Now, one of the pieces of research that's been done in the US by Rick Pildes in New York is that his analysis is that it used to be the case uh, when the two major parties were choosing their presidential candidates that the leaders of the party, people behind the scenes, ensured that they were sensible, credible candidates. And the more they moved towards primaries, that is a so-called democratic approach, the worse it became. People moved to the extremes. And in this country, you've seen exactly the same thing where Jeremy Corbyn for Labour and Liz Truss for the Conservatives were both elected by the party members, a smaller electorate than the primaries in the US. But nevertheless, this attempt to claim that things are becoming more democratic seems to have taken us in the wrong direction. That's a very deep question, which I do discuss in the book. Um, along with many other controversial issues. So what does it mean to have a democratic system? Mm. And I have a lot of quite radical ideas there, which you might come to, uh, such as that we should have a, a house which is selected by a lot, if you want to know how <laughs> radical. And I really believe this. But the, um, the point is, how do we think political parties should fit into a democratic system? And the... Uh, there are two views, I think, essentially on this, which is that political parties belong ultimately to their members, their organizations, their association that belong to their members. The members should choose who their party's uh, representatives are with, uh, uh, um, and that works pretty well when the, and, and the, sorry, and the representatives should uh, then choose the leaders. So that's the traditional way yeah. we worked. And that's not quite how America worked because, but it was essentially active members of the party that chose the groups that then got together to caucus to choose the president. Um, and the, the throwing it open to a much wider group of members are uh, in the U of supporters in the US through the primaries and in the UK are throwing open the leadership to uh, from the house the, the the people who are actually in elected yeah. to the house into the membership of the parties has in, had a rather similar respects effects or tended to which is they've given enormous weight to the most fanatical elements in our political communities. And 
the consequence of that, which is pretty visible, particularly when they're getting more fanatical over time, which is another factor, is that they, they naturally choose some pretty extreme people. And the most obvious example of that in our case was the choice by the Conservative membership of Liz Truss over Rishi Sunak, um, which crashed and burned, fortunately, relatively quickly. But it was pretty obvious to anyone who knew anything about this that this was going to be a disaster. Now, fortunately in our system, we can get rid of disasters relatively quickly, and that was, I think, a good thing. But in the American system, they can't. And essentially, there is nobody who runs the cons Republican Party at any seniority who thinks that Donald Trump, and I know quite a few of them, is an even borderline credible president. But it doesn't matter because the people who vote for him, who are not active members of the party, they're just his supporters, turn out in the primaries and appoint him over their heads. My feeling uh, is that this is not an affirmation of democracy, but uh, a, uh, essentially a, a, a repudiation in the sense that it gives the ultimate electorate a choice between candidates uh, uh, one or more of whom are just wildly unsuitable, but since they've got to choose one of the two and they're basically sympathetic to one side, they end up choosing a Republican who might well not be at the margin the person they want. Um, and that, I think, is something they have to think about. So the deep question is, who should choose the party's representatives in the, the House or the Congress or in the House of Parliament, and who should choose the leaders? And that is something that's been transformed in both cases in an ostensibly democratic way, and the result is not necessary to the satisfaction of the wider public. I mean, this is a pretty good refutation of the Whig theory of history. Clearly, things haven't gone in uniformly an improved way. Well, one of the things that I discuss, and it's a very deep question, uh, is the role and functioning and limits of constraining institutions of many kinds on democracy. Um, the, the, the obvious point, which is central, so just to make clear why there's a danger, if you have a political process which selects somebody with, let's be quite clear, wildly autocratic aims, and that person then becomes the head of government and state, and that person then used the powers of the heads of government and state, which are enormous, to subvert the electoral process, you end up with a dictatorship. And that has been happening all over the world. It hasn't yet happened in a major high-income country, but I don't think they were all that far away from that in the US. And they, I don't think if Trump becomes president again, which is perfectly possible, that they will be all that way far away from it then. So what the danger is that the democratic system eats itself out from within. And most of the autocracies we now have have that characteristic. It's not a coup by the army or anything. They, those are basically gone, even in Latin America. It's a, it's a hollowing out of the system from within and it's capture by a leader who has been democratically elected but then destroys all the checks and balances in the system. And that, to put it, I'm not making any other comparison. I'm not making any other comparison, let me be clear. But that's what Hitler did. Yeah. Now you also talk in the book, and this is clearly related to what Hitler did in terms of running the German economy. You also talk about that evolution of autocratic leaders and government as being very damaging to a market economy. Yes, I think if we look at, so one of the themes is, you know, capitalism as an economic system is quite protean and it can be made to fit in with all sorts of political systems and will work better and well. It can be, you know, put in, in a very cuddly way with the incredibly successful Danish economy. Yeah. It, can be, it can be American. And it can sort of be Chinese or Turkish, as it is now. I'm just choosing this as an example. Um, but the interactions are very important. They affect how it works. 
So if you end up with an autocratic system, and there'll be many examples, though mostly in developing and emerging countries, but Russia's become similar, you then tend to get something very clear. The legal systems are subverted by the autocrat, because what's the point of being an autocrat if you can't tell the judges what to do? So, uh, so that means the, the protection of, since the autocrat controls the army and the police, and the security service, all the other security services, anybody who's in business, however rich, is completely at his mercy, yeah. obviously, unless he escapes, and all his property. So he basically has to do whatever the autocrat tells him to do, so he becomes a crony. And the autocrat's economic regime becomes crony capitalism in which either the existing plutocrats are made his tools, or more often, he appoints some of his own. And uh, uh, I don't wish to give you examples around the world, but I can give you an awful lot of examples, some of whom have been in the press quite recently, of people who have made immense fortunes because they're very close to the head of government. Yeah. This is not a very good way to run a competitive market economy, and it's one of the reasons why I think in the long run democracy works better, because politics is competitive. Now, the alternative system which is really interesting, of course, well, I think we'll talk about later, is China's. Yeah. China's is the one fully articulated, institutionalized autocratic system, um, whatever you call it, uh, and it, they have actually developed a sort of capitalism that goes with this. Uh, but it's become very obvious in the last 10 years, and indeed in some senses what she was about, that he thinks it went too far, that the capitalists got too rich in a lawless economy. It's an economy that doesn't operate with normal legal constraints. That means they get rich by bribing officials. Of course they do. We all know that. Everybody knows that in China. So the, uh, and he thinks that subverts the Communist Party. And because it's subverting the Communist Party, it erodes confidence of the people in the Communist Party big time. So we had this anti-corruption campaign and everything. Else. So basically, he's been waging war against the capitalists for a decade, and it's got worse until just now when he's reversed it for about God knows how long. It's terrified the wits out of all the capitalists, and lots of them have left, and they've stopped investing, and all the investment now has been in useless real estate, and China's growth is slowing. So that's also a bad system, though they, he's operating within a very dynamic society. Um, so those are the comp com that's yeah. the competition, and that's the danger um, uh, we face, and I think we're already quite a way down that, chain, that path. So I wanted to ask you later about China, but let's do it now. Well, you, you brought this in in yes, a way with the autocracy yeah. point. So do you think that China can continue down this path? And how do you think it affects the way we in the West should respond to what we think of as the communist world? Well, there are two quite different questions. The first of which... Uh, on which I'm quite clear is that I really don't think anybody knows how China is going to evolve. Um, I've thought about this, I've sort of, I'm a complete ignoramus in a sense, but I'm fascinated by the country and have been there basically once or twice a year for the last 30, and I have quite a few senior friends, but I wouldn't claim to know it at all. But if you look at the history, it can make extraordinary changes very quickly. And one of the most striking was from the Maoism, Maoism of the early 70s to what Deng Xiaoping's did. It was yeah. a real, yeah. incredible transformation. And uh, I can say that after the Tiananmen uh, crime, uh, the, 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 the brutal suppression of Tiananmen uh, protests, everybody thought reform was over. And that was actually the opposite of the truth. So I don't know what's going to happen. But it's very, very clear that the system is struggling with the question is how do we maintain the integrity of what we think of as that communist system with me at the top in the case of Xi while having a dynamic progressive internationally integrated market economy and uh, I think they're struggling with this at the moment and their instinct at the moment for now for quite a while has been to suppress quite a bit of the market system. Um, now, that creates all sorts of challenges for them in terms of sustaining growth and sustaining the popular appeal of the party, which has really depended on making Chinese people rich, 
There are lots of issues. But of course, in the meantime, we have a set of challenges because here is a, a communist China which has reaffirmed very strongly under Xi its communist nature. It has become considerably more internationally assertive mm -hmm. because of its power. And that has created a reaction, particularly in America, which has a tendency towards Manichaeism, uh, to, view the, to, 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 to take the verse view. So relations are breaking down. And that's one of the, going to be, that is already one of the biggest challenges in our world. And I have a chapter which discusses what this might mean. And broadly speaking, I think we are uh, going to have to manage potential conflicts. Uh, we have to do so without ending up in war. We have to cooperate on major global challenges, not just the environment, which is obvious, but also development, where both sides are deeply involved. And we have to do so to do all this while preserving our basic economic and um, military security. And all I can say is it's an, that is a stupendous challenge, far more difficult on multiple fronts than the relationship with the Soviet Union because China is so inexorably intertwined. It's the biggest manufacturing exporter in the world uh, with the entire world economy and has so many important trade relations. I just feel that no Western politician is really focusing hard enough on how much bigger an issue that ultimately is likely to be than Russia, though of course that rules out, assumes that we're not going to end up in a nuclear war. I mean